I would add my word of greeting to everyone who's tuning in uh, for this service of worship. We, I would reiterate what Neil said. We'd love to hear from you, our members and visitors, any uh, guests out there. If there are ways we can serve or help you during this time of isolation, uh, we would love to be a part of your life. Our next lesson uh, is listed in the bulletin. It goes all the way from Genesis 15 through Genesis 18. And really we could go back to uh, the 12th chapter of Genesis with the call of Abraham because this morning what I want to do in worship kind of as a follow-up to what I did last week talking about the nature, the amazing nature of God and surprising ways he greets us and works with us. And this is an example of what I was saying uh, last week. So we're going to look, take a light-hearted look, if you will, at the story of Abraham and Sarah and see what we can discern that might be applicable to our lives. So I'm only going to read a portion of this story. I'm going to read the first 15 verses of chapter 18 in Genesis. Um, and I'll be reading from Eugene Peterson's uh, rendering of the Bible called The Message, a paraphrase of the Bible. First, let us look to God in prayer. Eternal God, we ask with the psalmist that you would open our eyes, that we might behold wonderful and amazing things out of your law. And we ask this in the name of the living word, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Genesis 18, 1 to 15. God appeared to Abraham at the Oaks of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance of his tent. It was the hottest part of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing and he ran from his tent to greet them and bowed before them. He said, Master, if it please you, stop for a while with your servant. I'll get some water so that you can wash your feet and rest under this tree. I'll get some food to refresh you on your way since your travels have brought you across my path. Perfect act of Hebrew uh, hospitality here. And they said, Certainly, go ahead. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. And he said, hurry, get some cups of our best flour, knead it, and make some bread. Then Abraham ran to the cattle pen and picked out a nice plump calf and gave it to the servant who lost no time in getting it ready. Then he got curds and milk and brought them with the calf that had been roasted and set the meal before the men and stood there under the tree while they ate. The men said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? He said, in the tent. One of them said, I'm coming back about this time next year, and when I arrive, your wife Sarah will have a son. Sarah was listening at the tent opening just behind the man. Abraham and Sarah were old by this time, very old. Sarah was far past the age for having babies. Sarah laughed within herself. An old woman like me, she's thinking, get pregnant with this old man of a husband? God said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Me, have a baby, an old woman like me? Is anything too hard for God? Good question. Is anything too hard for God? I'll be back about this time next year, and Sarah will have a baby. Sarah lied. She said, I didn't laugh because she was afraid. But he said, Yes, you did. You laughed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What will the little old ladies think? I can't tell you how many times in the course of my 50 years or so ministry, people have said that to me. What will the little old ladies think? Usually it's said right after I or someone else, maybe someone in the church does something that's a bit out of the ordinary, perhaps unexpected, uh, completely new and different. One particular instance comes to mind for me. Some of you know that we have vacationed for, or really since 1973, so a long time, with three other couples. Uh, every year we choose a place to go for a week together with children and all of that. And we, all of the uh, husbands were classmates in seminary, at Union Presbyterian Seminary in Richmond, Virginia. All of the wives, as it turned out, happened to be public school teachers at the time. At any rate, the way we functioned as a team when we spent the weeks together, and we're still doing that, is we divide up responsibilities. So it was my particular day to go into town 
and to get the provisions that we needed, both the needs and the wishes, I guess you would say. Now back then, this was in 1979, I remember that this year we were at Atlantic Beach outside of Wilmington, uh, North Carolina. No, outside of Moorhead City, North Carolina. At any rate, it was my turn to go shopping and so I went to a, a mall where there was a, a, a grocery store. And when I was coming out of the grocery store, I noticed a beauty salon nearby. Now back then there was something that was gaining popularity, a new hairstyle for men. And it required getting a permanent, a really curly permanent in your ha hair. And so I was kind of sick of the way I'd been combing my hair for 33 years at that point. And uh, I was feeling a little frisky, I guess. I was a thousand miles from home. Uh, no one I knew would see me. So I said, I'm going to go get a permanent, see what I look like. Right back then, Mac Davis was uh, popular on TV. He was a, a singer. And uh, at any rate, I thought, well, I may do that myself. So I went and got uh, a permanent in my hair. And my first of many times sitting under one of these beehive hair dryers. I'd never done that in my life. Had no anticipation that I would ever do it. But at any rate, I did. Well, I went back to the beach house where all our crew was gathered. And I wish you could have been there to see the reaction. Some people just sat there slack-jawed. Others fell on the floor just laughing. Uh, and I assure you that the amount of money I spent for that permanent and the amount of time I invested in it was well worth the reaction that I got from our friends uh, that particular week in 1979. Well, um, after that, one of our, my buddies who was part of the group said to me, Massey, you don't have the courage to wear that back to Mississippi, to the Presbyterian Church where you're serving now. That's not the exact way he put it, but close enough for pulpit, pulpit purposes. So uh, something about me loves a challenge, I guess. So I said, well, yes, I am. I'm going to go back home with this little uh, afro and uh, I guess do a gut check on how loyal and supportive my flock was back in Mississippi and whether they would tolerate that or not. So we arrived back home late Saturday night. First time anyone saw me in the church was when I walked into the pulpit on Sunday morning. Well, the reaction was not unlike what I had experienced at the beach. There was just kind of a gulp. My associate at the time said that uh, it was like all the, all the air left the, the sanctuary because everyone took a breath at the same time. Uh, but it was a shock. Uh, and what about the little old ladies? How did they take this? Well, let me assure you, the little old ladies did quite fine. I ended up wearing that hairstyle for about three years, actually. And uh, the little old ladies in the church were quite fine with it. I had a lot more trouble with their little old husbands than I did with little old ladies. But for the most part, I've discovered that little old ladies get a bad rap by many people, maybe most people, because I've always found that it is the women of the church, sometimes the older women, who for the most part are flexible and resilient and adventuresome and much more open to doing the new thing than you would imagine given their reputation. And in every church where I've ever been a member or have ever served on staff, it has not escaped my attention that it's primarily the little old ladies that carry on the bulk of the work of the church. They're the most energetic, the most innovative, the most creative, the most fearless, the most faithful, and the most supportive of the program and work of the church and of the staff of the church as well. So this morning I'm suggesting to you that when people refer to little old ladies, it has nothing to do with being little or old or even ladies. Rather, being a little old lady means having a mindset that is resistant to change, closed to new ideas, disinterested in new possibilities and new challenges. In a spiritual sense, little old ladies are those people of every age and gender and size who believe that God has no surprises in store for them and they're not open, consequently, to new possibilities. They're not even looking for them in their lives. With all this in mind, I want us to take a fresh and somewhat uh, humorous look at the story of Abraham and Sarah. The announcement to Abraham and Sarah that they are about to become parents. It had been promised years and years and years ago 
But now the promise is going to be carried out and fulfilled. The only problem was Sarah was now 90 years old and Abraham was 100. And so with apologies to the holy men taught by the Holy Ghost who comprised our scriptures and also with apologies to Frederick Beekner in his book Telling the Truth, The Gospel is Comedy, Tragedy, and Fairy Tale, I would like to retell the story of Abraham and Sarah with a modern slant to it. So I invite you to hear this old story in a new way. And for the most part, I'm using Beekner's rendering of this, although I've tweaked it at points and added some dialogue to the story. So just sit back and hear the story today. Once upon a time, back in Mesopotamia, Abe and Sarah became husband and wife. It was a marriage made in heaven, they all said, and after a brief honeymoon trip down the Tigris and Euphrates River, they settled down to a quiet and comfortable life there in Ur of the Chaldees. They were buying a nice little ranch-style home in the suburbs. They had a two-car garage, a color TV, a microwave oven, and a grill out back. Someone had even given them as a wedding present a baby crib. And they had a room all prepared for the day they would use that baby crib and bring their first child home. Their families lived by in Mesopotamia and often kidded them about being willing to step in at any time to babysit as needed. Sarah bought her clothes at a fashionable boutique downtown and did volunteer work at the King's Daughters Hospital and was secretary of the Junior League. She was also in charge of the program for young, for young couples at the Fertile Crescent Presbyterian Church. Young Abe, not to be outdone, was a promising junior executive at Chaldean Bank and Trust, pulling down a rather nice salary for a young man, plus he had generous fringe benefits and an enlightened pension program. And then something happened. Abraham got religion. Or as his friends privately put it, religion got Abraham. Regardless, Abe became convinced that he and Sarah should pull up stakes and head out for a land called Canaan they had never seen or never heard of, but where the Lord had promised that he would bless them when they got there and they would be the progenitors of a great nation and even be a blessing to all the families of the earth. Now, Canaan didn't appeal at all to Sarah. She'd never heard of the place, never seen any travel brochures on it. Um, but the idea of having children certainly appealed to her. It was her lifelong dream. And she had become a little anxious about the fact of having children because her OBGYN hadn't been very encouraging. Nonetheless, Sarah thought, well, if we're going to move, better to do so now before I get pregnant and before we have children. So Abe and Sarah put their house on the market. They gave their color TV to the Habitat resale store. They rented a U-Haul at Trailer. And they packed up that crib and a few other items, and they set off for this long journey to a land they knew not. They also made the mistake of taking their brother-in-law with them, Lot, a decision that they would later regret. Abraham had written an eloquent letter of resignation to the president and board of the bank, and he had received an equally eloquent, or eloquent letter in reply, assuring him that should there ever be a, a time when he wished to return, there would be a job waiting for him. Now, the original draft of that letter had said if he ever regained his senses and came back home, there'd be a job. But the president changed his language, thinking it would be more appropriate to take a milder approach. After all, the president had nothing against religion as such. He just felt that it needed to be practiced in moderation, much like exercise and alcohol. But clearly, Abraham and Sarah were going overboard here, and it was an absurd thing that they were doing. Now, in Yiddish, the word shlemiel can be translated as someone who goes around spilling his soup on someone else. And the word shlemazel applies to that person that has the soup fall into his or her lap. And there's no question about it, but Abraham proved to be a shlemazel after he left Mesopotamia. Almost everything worked against him. Sarah was such a beautiful and shapely young woman that he was afraid that Pharaoh, they would have to travel through Pharaoh's territory, and, and others might kill him in order to claim her as his wife. So he told Sarah, just introduce yourself as my sister, and then I'll be safe. It was 
a decision he had to later own up to, and he lost considerable face and credibility when he did that, but it proved to be a rather nice financial bonanza for him. When, after many frustrating and disappointing years, Sarah became convinced that she would never have a child, she told Abraham, well, why don't you have a child with my maid, Hagar? Abraham decided to take her up on the offer, and in so doing, he stirred up a hornet's nest in his home. Hagar is acting haughtily, Sarah later claimed. You have to choose which one of us you want, Hagar or me. It was an unpleasant situation at best. But Abraham stuck by Sarah because, after all, she had stuck by him and had been willing to leave home and go traipsing off for the far country. Another thing that went wrong was that when Abraham reached the promised land, a nasty situation developed between him and his in-laws, Lot and his crowd. Lot and his people claimed that there, this place of Canaan wasn't big enough for both families, and Abraham's crowd said they couldn't agree more. So Abraham proposed that they divide Canaan in two, and then one would take one part and one would take the other. The mistake was he let Lot take the first, make the first choice. And of course, Lot chose that fertile land down by the River Jordan, and left Abraham with uh, the barren disaster area known locally as Dead Man's Gulch. So you see that while Canaan was, all of Canaan was a part of the promised land, some of the land was considerably more promising than other parts, and Abraham discovered that. That wasn't the only thing. The women's fertility clinic in Canaan told Sarah, told Sarah that there were few, if any, chances that she would ever conceive and bear a child. So here they are, years later, Abe and Sarah, two once hopeful, once energetic, once trusting people, living in a tent in Dead Man's Gulch. Was this really the promised land flowing with milk and honey that they'd been told of? And what about God's promise of children and descendants? Well, at this point, it all seemed a strange hoax. And so it was that the years rolled by faster and faster like empty baby buggies until Abraham was a hundred and Sarah was ninety. And God's promise, well, it seemed as far away as Mesopotamia. And Sarah, well, physically, mentally, and spiritually, she had been reduced to being a little old lady. She had ceased to believe or hope for miracles. Her years of productivity were behind her, her zest for living, her seasons of confident trust in God were now all a thing of the past. There was nothing new under the sun, and all of her adventures were behind her. At least, that is what she thought. Then one day, something very strange happened. Theologians call it a theophany, a visible manifestation of God. Three men, really disguised as traveling agents, uh, came to pay a visit to Abraham beneath the sacred oaks at Mamre. While Sarah listened from the doorway of the tent, she overheard the Lord's announcement through these guests that God was going to make good on that promise at long last, and that in nine months she and Abraham were going to be the proud parents of a son. Well, you know what they did. And they laughed. At first they tried to hold back the laughter, to choke it down, or to think of something else, because it's serious business when you're in the presence of God and you dare not laugh in his presence, should you? But the more they tried to contain their laughter, the more hilarious and absurd the whole situation became. One account suggests that Abraham laughed until he fell on his face. Other accounts said it was actually Sarah who laughed, first at herself, however. I wonder if you're acquainted with the word titter. Titter is a verb which means to laugh with convulsive efforts at suppression. That's what happened to Abe and Sarah at 190 respectively. They tittered there beside the tent beneath the oaks called Mamre. They tried to suppress what was hilariously funny, and their efforts almost convulsed them. Of course, you've been in situations like that, haven't you? Maybe you're sitting in church or you're, you're at a funeral or wedding, and suddenly something strikes you as funny, so funny you're about to burst. And the harder you try to hold back the laughter, the more difficult it becomes. Tears start streaming down your face. Your face turns red. You put your hands over your face, but it's all to no avail. Eventually, 
And that's going to come out. So Abraham and Sarah laughed, and had it been you or me, I think we would have laughed as well. They laughed when they looked at each other and thought about all the possibilities for the future. They laughed when they thought of a baby being born in the geriatric ward of the Canaan General Hospital, and they collapsed on the floor. As they were lying on the floor laughing and wiping away their tears, Abraham spoke up and said, Sarah, call Medicare and see if they have maternity benefits. And they laughed some more. And Sarah responded, Abe, when you stop by CVS and pick up my polygrip, will you pick up some Pampers as well? And they laughed some more. Oh no, Sarah suddenly cried. I gave our baby crib to the church auction for the youth. And they laugh some more. Abraham and Sarah laugh because the angel not only seemed to believe the message, but he seemed to expect them to believe it too. They laugh because part of them really does believe and because another part of them said it would take a senile fool to fall for something like this. They laugh because laughter is better than crying perhaps and maybe not all that different. They laugh because if by some crazy chance the angel's message was true, then there really would be something to laugh about, something to celebrate, something even to live for. They laugh at God, they laugh with God, they laugh at themselves because laughter and weeping are alike in that regard. No matter what the immediate occasion for your laughter or your tears, the object usually ends up being yourself and your own life. But I want you to notice something interesting about the laughter of Abraham and Sarah. The Lord doesn't condemn them for it at all. He seems, as it were, to join right in. When God asked Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? She immediately becomes frightened and denies that she laughed. And God responds more in sympathy than in condemnation. Yes, you did. You laughed, Sarah. And then the Lord even suggests that they name their son Isaac. Do you know what Isaac means in Hebrew? Laughter. Laughter. So one interpretation might be that not God not only tolerated their laughter, but he blessed it and he baptized it and he gave it a namesake. Wouldn't it be fair to say that when we get to the close of this story, Sarah might still have been a little old lady in the technical sense, but surely she didn't have a little old lady mentality. Try to convince Sarah, an expectant Sarah at the age of 90, or Abe at the age of 100 that God has no surprises in store for you. Try to tell Sarah and Abe that God cannot do a miraculous and wonderful things in us and through us Try to tell Sarah and Abe that God doesn't keep his promises or that there's nothing new under the sun. Try to tell this little old lady that and she would just laugh in your face. So friends, here's the point. Are we open to God's doing new and miraculous things in our lives, in our families, in our churches, in our communities, in our world? Are we open to that? Do we believe that despite our age, our size, our gender, our circumstances, we are not beyond the reach or the use of our God? I'd like to close with a similar story, really. When I first preached on this, I clipped out an article that was in the newspaper, an Associated Press article, that was headlined with these words, Handy Woman is Classic Little Old Lady. It was the story about a 73-year-old woman in Sayreville, New Jersey. Now, I happened to be 73 at the time, but I considered 73 really old back then. But at any rate, I kept the article, and I want to read you a portion of it. To look at Louise Snyder would be anybody's uh, ca candidate for the classic little old lady. She is little, about five feet two, has white hair, rimless glasses, She's 73. She crochets dainty things, embroiders, makes her own dresses, and bakes pies for the church bazaar. But wait, could that be her climbing up on that scaffolding? Yes, it is. 
Grandmotherly Louise Snyder also might be the best known paper hanger, painter, carpenter, bricklayer, concrete pourer, and all round handyman or handywoman in town. I've never thought of work as being man's work or woman's work, she said. Work is work and you do what you have to do. Well, obviously, Louise Snyder did more than what she had to do. In addition to all her paper hanging and painting, the article said that she was an active member of the First Presbyterian Church in Sayreville. At one point, she baked 10 loaves of bread a day and sold them to waiting customers to help pay for the installation of a stained glass window in the sanctuary of her church. Now, 12 years after reading and saving that article, I found it when I was working on this passage again. And I started wondering, whatever happened to Louise Snyder? So in the early 90s, I picked up my phone, I placed a call to the First Presbyterian Church of Sayreville, and asked the minister who answered the phone, who was relatively new in that position, if there was still a member of his church by the name of Louise Snyder. Indeed there is, he said. And if you had called yesterday, you would have found her here at the church because she was here all day making coleslaw for the Christian education supper last night. He went on to say that she was as active as she had ever been at the age of 85 now. She was in charge of the pork chop dinner coming up the next week uh, that, at the church. And she was really put out with the session because the session had voted to uh, do a renovation of the manse and she had volunteered to do all the paper hanging and painting. But the session told her she couldn't do that. I think they were afraid of seeing Miss Snyder up on a ladder at the age of 85. May God bless the Abes and Sarahs and Louise Snyders of this world. May God bless all the little old ladies and little old men, the middle-aged men and middle-aged ladies, all the boys and girls who refuse to give in to the temptation to think that they're beyond the use of God or beyond the reach of God, that God can't use them right in their present circumstances. This is just one of the wonderful and amazing things about the God that we worship and serve. He takes us and uses us as we are and accomplishes wonderful things. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we know that you never give up on us, so help us never to give up on ourselves or on others. We rejoice that you are a God who can do things in us and through us greater than we could even ask or imagine. So keep us open to new possibilities for our lives and for our service to you and others and make us effective channels of your love and your power and your promises, whatever our age or circumstances. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.